It's the rootinest, tootinest episode of NES Works yet, as Capcom brings us Gunsmoke. A year and a half from the NES's full US rollout, we have some definite VIP publishers taking shape. Obviously Nintendo is hard to top, having delivered roughly half the console's library to date, ranging from the good but dated early black box titles to the all-timers like Super Mario Bros. and Punch-Out. But a couple of third parties have proven themselves real heroes too. First, Konami started strong with Gradius and then kept up their standards with quality titles like Russian Attack, Double Dribble, and of course Castlevania. But there's also Capcom. One of the very earliest third parties for the NES, Capcom didn't make the greatest first impression thanks to kicking off with some very dicey straight arcade conversions produced by Ghost Studio Micronics. No one would look at 1942 and Ghost and Goblins and think, ah, this developer's a real keeper. To the company's credit though, they quickly turned things around. Beginning with Commando, Capcom moved development in-house and began reworking their games to better suit the nuances of the NES hardware. A year after the arrival of the similarly revamped Trojan, and just a few weeks after the newly created for NES Mega Man, we have the next of Capcom's arcade overhauls for NES, Gunsmoke. While we still haven't reached the pinnacle of the studio's NES conversions, Gunsmoke is definitely getting there. As reinventions of an existing game go, this is much less radical than Section Z, but you can see a similar mode of design thought at work. Section Z took a linear side-scrolling shoot-em-up and turned it into a complex, exploratory quest through an alien labyrinth, giving players a power-up system, hidden rooms, new bosses to defeat, and a tricky maze of interconnecting chambers to conquer. Gunsmoke remains every bit as linear a vertical shooter on NES as its arcade incarnation was, but it dresses up the action a bit to give the players some choice in how they approach the vertical scrolling. These new additions also help pad out the game, which has been truncated from 10 stages to 6, but that's neither here nor there. In terms of the Capcom lineage, Gunsmoke is very much playing to the company's early strengths. The studio came into this world dealing Zevius-inspired vertical shooters, and even in 1988 as their development portfolio has begun to diversify, they still clearly love their vertical shooters. They also clearly love American pop culture. With its Wild West theme, Gunsmoke fits right alongside 1942 and Commando's World War II themes, though this time without placing Japan and its Axis allies in the player's sights. The game shares its title with a vintage television series that starred Matt Dillon, but there's conflicting information online as to whether or not there was meant to be any real connection. Some sources say yes, others no. Personally, I lean toward no. Capcom had a thing for naming conflicts in this era. The Rockman series had to be renamed Mega Man of the West due to overlapping trademarks. No doubt, the seemingly random period between gun and smoke is an attempt to curtail that. But while it may not be tied to the TV series, Gunsmoke is definitely connected to one of the most successful gaming franchises of the modern era. An attempt to create a 3D reboot of Gunsmoke mutated into Red Dead Revolver, which then led to the Red Dead Redemption series, which made Rockstar and Take-Two, but not Capcom, extremely wealthy. Gunsmoke is a far more limited game than those, however, and is a lot less interested in presenting a realistic glimpse of the final days of the American frontier. It's a simple game that fills its stages not only with hired guns, but also with burly Native Americans and, inexplicably, a lot of ninja. I realize that the timing of this episode for the same week as Thanksgiving in the US is not really ideal, given that it involves the wanton slaughter of an entire indigenous tribe, so my apologies for that. Anyway, we can probably credit the game's nature and design to the involvement of Yoshiki Okamoto, who crafted the arcade incarnation of Gunsmoke as an evolution of the company's previous shooters. Gunsmoke's design places it somewhere between 1942 and Commando in terms of complexity and features. At first glance, there definitely looks to be more of Commando about the game than anything else. Here as there, you control a human, rather than some sort of fighter craft, moving about on foot rather than flying. However, unlike in Commando, protagonist Billy Bob is far more limited in his capabilities than Super Joe was. The screen scrolls automatically upward, forcing you to obey the computer's pace rather than your own. Even more significantly, Billy Bob can only fire in three directions rather than eight. Super Joe could turn, walk, and fire in all directions in Commando. Billy Bob can move freely about the field, but he can only fire straight ahead and at a roughly 30 degree angle to either side. This, I think, is intended as Okamoto's solution to the close quarters conundrum of Commando, and also of Ikari Warriors. That is, how do you give the player the freedom to fire in multiple directions in a shooter without tying it to their movement and constantly getting into tight scrapes where they have to move into the path and the fire of an aggressive nearby enemy in order to take out that foe? 
whereas Commando was designed by Tokuro Fujiwara of Ghost and Goblins fame, and therefore was probably created with no small sense of relish for the difficult situations it forced players into, Gunsmoke reflects Okamoto's approach to game design. It's fast, responsive, challenging, yet fair, and short on needless embellishments and frills. Gunsmoke's solution for combat facing is similar to the one implemented for Section Z, not the arcade game where you had a dedicated button for turning 180 degrees, which is frankly an awful setup. No, it's more akin to the NES game, where a separate button controls a different angle of fire. Rather than tying the attack buttons to forward and reverse, Gunsmoke's arcade cabinet instead gave players three buttons, one for each angle of fire. This led to a fast-paced take on the shooter, with responsive controls and an endless stream of enemies and projectiles to dodge while giving the player the ability to aim to either side. By gunning down foes at an angle, players no longer need to scurry around the field of combat to draw a beat on targets. This makes for a more conservative, controlled experience where every dodge and juke by the player has more impact, and you're less likely to dash into a bullet on the other side of the screen while trying to take aim at a distant threat. The NES conversion does its level best to bring these dynamics and mechanics to a far more limited system than the custom arcade board that powered the coin-op game. Despite the NES controller sporting two buttons rather than three, Gunsmoke even maintains the separate button-based gun control setup. Here, B fires to the left, A to the right, and both buttons simultaneously fire straight ahead. It's not perfect, but it works, and it seems especially well-suited for the arcade-style NES Advantage joystick that Nintendo shipped at the end of 1987. Gunsmoke also suffers a few other compromises in making its way to the NES. In addition to losing 40% of its stages, it also sees a reduction in the number of unique bosses and enemies, the volume of hazards on screen at any given time, the extra vertical resolution afforded by a Tate orientation monitor, and the crisp, overall vibe of the arcade machine. By this point, however, Capcom had a pretty good handle on the limitations of the NES and had begun concocting ways to make their games hold up on less capable hardware. As had become the company's standard procedure by this point, Gunsmoke adds new elements to the action in order to give players an experience better suited to the home platform, where running out of quarters was no longer the biggest obstacle to success. In this case, the home team took notes from another recent Okamoto project, Black Tiger, the game that introduced the concept of an economy to Capcom action games. Black Tiger had been a fast-paced combination action platformer and shooter, another of many takes on the Rygar, Rastan Saga, Karnov, etc. concept, but one with a difference. The money that dropped when you killed enemies had a functional purpose. You could duck into shops along the way to buy things like magic and healing points. It's a concept that Capcom likely lifted from Sega's Fantasy Zone, and it would show up in many more Capcom arcade games down the line. Gunsmoke is notable for being the first time this concept made its way to the NES. While ducking and weaving between waves of outlaws, Billy Bob could make contact with the occasional peaceful townsperson, who would then offer to sell them upgrades. Most of these upgrades take the form of weapons, which range from the inexpensive but incredibly useful shotgun, which turns Billy Bob's dual pistol fire into a wide fan of bullets, to the powerful screen-clearing smart bomb. There are some crucial additional upgrades as well. You can buy a horse, which gives Billy Bob a small degree of defense. Normally one hit by a bad guy will do him in, but a horse protects him from an enemy bullet. More critically, there's also the wanted poster. Each level has a wanted poster at one of its shops imprinted with the name and appearance of the stage's boss. Until you acquire that boss's wanted poster, the boss simply won't appear. You need a poster to open up the end-of-level encounter that allows you to advance to the next stage. Otherwise, the current stage simply loops indefinitely, sending you through the same scenery and the same waves of enemies ad nauseum. Each loop of the stage has value. As you break the barrels littering each stage and gun down bad guys, you'll often receive cash drops as a reward. So the longer you cycle through a level, the more cash you can stockpile, and the more good stuff you can invest in. You can actually acquire multiple secondary weapons if you like. Gunsmoke has a limited menu subscreen where you can choose your current loadout. And the longer you play, the more likely you are to acquire speed and gun boosts, which increase your rate of movement and your range of fire. It's a clever idea, but it doesn't quite work here as well as it will in future Capcom creations. The need to hoard cash and invest in weapons isn't necessarily bad, but it takes quite a while to build up the reserves to purchase things from NPCs. Yet you lose all your purchases and power-ups the instant you die. In an arcade-style game with single-hit kills, that means you can spend several minutes grinding for the money to buy a devastating weapon, cash in, then die and lose it, and the money you invested into it, before you even get to use it. See, secondary weapons are powered by ammunition icons, and the stingy shopkeepers don't preload the weapons they sell you. You need to buy or collect ammo drops in order to be able to use a weapon upgrade, and not all shops even sell ammo. This creates an even worse version of the Gradius effect, 
where dying leaves you powered down in your weakest state. Not only does that happen here, but you also lose everything you've invested in. It's especially frustrating when you die because an enemy walks into the screen right next to you and bumps into you before you can even react, something that happens especially often during boss battles. The only small mercies Gunsmoke offers are that you continue almost exactly where you were when you died, rather than being sent back to a distant checkpoint, and you get to keep the current wanted poster if you fall in battle. That's good because the wanted posters become astronomically expensive beyond the first couple of stages. By the end of the game, you'll need to complete one or more level loops just to earn the cash to buy a poster, let alone bolster yourself with weapons and ammo. And all of this amounts to nothing if you build up a ferocious arsenal with which to take on the boss, only to die to an unlucky hit and end up forced to battle him in your next life with only your default short-range pistols. The bosses are cleverly designed and command a varied array of tactics that complement their overall theme, but they can also be frustrating to fight due to the inconsistent way your attacks interact with them. Each boss has extended periods of invulnerability, including a drawn-out opening sequence that forces you to watch them shuffle along and make a first strike while you're left unable to counter for a good 30 seconds or so. Your attacks also tend to be literally hit or miss, with very definite strikes frequently failing to register as a successful attack. And while you're struggling to dodge the boss's attacks and coax the game to acknowledge your hits, the boss's henchmen appear infinitely from all angles. It can be pretty annoying given how much time and virtual money are at stake in these fights. Run out of lives and you have to do it all over. The final boss is particularly ridiculous, peppering the screen with endless projectiles and minions. And once you do manage to defeat him, he has additional phases that are just as difficult as the first. Take a single hit during all of this and you're back to the very start all over again. Overall, Gunsmoke's NES overhaul falls a bit short of Capcom's noble intentions, but you can see what the developers were going for here. And with each of their new NES releases over the next couple of years, we'll see them moving steadily closer to that golden ideal. Gunsmoke is ultimately most interesting for being a critical step in Capcom's road to greatness, and even its box art demonstrates the publisher's growing capabilities. Unusually, Gunsmoke shipped with two different packages in the US. The original version features an illustration in which Billy Bob takes aim at the viewer. The colors and the pose give it a definite Mega Man box art kind of vibe. This was replaced a few months later by a different box, which was far more refined, evocative of a movie poster. The game itself didn't change, just the box art, a sign that Capcom USA was beginning to realize its games deserved to be presented with packaging as good as the contents within. Next time on NES Works, sorry Senator, I have no recollection of that game ever happening.